Hey everybody, welcome back. I got a special guest that we're going to be featuring uh, this week, and that's uh, Gordon Neal here, my good, my good friend. Um, and yeah, he's going to talk a little bit about his work, what he's been working on, a little bit more about his process, and what is kind of working out for him currently. So welcome to the show, Gordon. How are you doing? Thank you very much for having me. It's a, it's a huge honor to be on the podcast with you. Um, I'm a massive fan, so yeah, this is cool. Well, what goes around comes around. I was lucky enough to join you last week, so on your show, yeah. which everyone, I'll have a link below, check out Gordon's channel. We, we, did, we did an interview and a discussion over there, and so I roped yeah. him in, got him on got him on the brush sauce for you guys, so yeah. awesome. Now, based off what we have here, you're, you're primarily a 3D artist, correct? I mean, I, initially, yeah, like in the current state of what I'm doing, yeah, it's mostly 3D. Um, but I did start as 2D concept as well. Awesome. Well, yeah, I'm tr always trying to get uh, more and more 3D fluent <laughs> people on the show as well because I, I, I talk a l way too much about the 2D side of things. So I think this will be a great yeah. opportunity and a great insight uh, today mm -hmm. to get people mm -hmm. a, a little bit more in the know of what kind of goes into a 3D pipeline. Yes. Awesome, cool. Um, yeah, like, well, 3D for me was, I think I'm a natural progression because I, I didn't paint and, draw, paint, paint and draw as much as I thought I should have when I was doing uh, traditional art. Uh, I know for some of the guys I've met in the industry who are at the top of their game, people who maybe work for, you know, big companies or do concept art for film and games, um, those guys never put a pencil down, have always got a sketchbook full. And for me, uh, 2D was interesting and I loved doing it, but then I did naturally find my flow more in 3D. Um, I think the the almost immediateness of it, like the, when you're creating shapes in 3D, you can almost within the first 30 minutes see what you're making and it doesn't look as maybe like, you know, if you're, if you're on, the, on the low side of the drawing skill, then, yes. you know, it takes, it takes a lot of effort for something to look really decent or something, you know, really plausible for a career. But for 3D, you can kind of fake your way through enough of it on the beginning <laughs> stages that it looks like, it looks decent enough. And then, then you can refine stuff as well. So Something um, measurable yeah. rather quickly. Yes, yes, that indeed. So oh, um, I can totally relate, uh, Gordon. I'm, I, I always consider myself on the low side of the drawing skill as well. I, I, can, oh, paint, no. I can paint my way out of a box, <laughs> but if it comes right. to drawing... Uh, I yeah. have to work way harder than I want to, to, to make a drawing work. So it's, yeah, I, I can kind of relate. Oh no, enough about me. Tell me about, <laughs> tell me more about what, what softwares are you using and, and what do you, what, how is that pipeline working out for you? Um, so yeah, so initially with, I mean, especially with the project that has caught everyone's eye and the one we're going to talk about, um, a quick just shout out that, um, this original scene was actually, um, if I can find it, if you can see, you, you can see my screen fine, right? You can mm -hmm. still see my, my, right, okay, so, so if you guys watching, you'll see this, this is me highlighting an artist, this is, uh, this is Tobias Coep, so I had Tobias on, uh, my podcast, uh, last year, I think, slightly, uh, just before he moved to Epic, he's working there now, as an environment artist on Fortnite, and uh, this was a tutorial he done way back when. I think this was 2015. Um, so even Tobias says that a lot of the tools and methodologies within this are kind of out of date because uh, even though 2D will progress, 3D goes even quicker. You know, the tools just become every couple of months or something else out that makes your process a lot more smooth. Um, so this was the tutorial I was following. My aim for this was to probably try and take a lot of the high level stuff that Tobias teaches. So he runs through a lot of his pipeline, which is typically Maya, or this Maya, uh, into ZBrush for a high poly mesh, uh, a low bake. Usually he uses things like X Normal, but I was using um, Marmoset Toolbag. Um, and then the, the texturing was done in Substance. Um, but then, of course, he hand textured everything uh, through 3D Coat, which means that everything you see in the scene here is hand painted. So he took those 2D skills and he uh, color graded and sketched and, and painted on these items to make them look uh, more like a Blizzard kind of feel, like a World of Warcraft feel. Um, what does a so, what does a three D artist refer to when they're just? I barely know this. I don't even think I, I do know. But like when you refer to something as baking like a texture mm -hmm. onto something, mm -hmm. what does that actually entail? So baking, so baking is a process that is used because um, you can't import high poly meshes into uh, game engines because game engines typically um well i mean in the past the more now we're coming with unreal 5 we're moving in the future where like you know polygon count isn't really an issue but to make engines run efficiently you have to make sure that you're you're squeezing the most out of everything so every asset has to have a low poly count now for that to happen you also want the textures to look believable and you want things to look round and not sharp and blocky 
So what you do is you take the high poly textures uh, of the, the asset. So for instance, if we look at my, my ZBrush files um, here, uh, this is uh, one of the doors are done, but for even something more simple, if you look at a brick I made, um, the brick itself, um, you know, in a low poly setting is, is just square, but then you bring in a ZBrush, you add texture, you make it look like a real brick, um, and then when you bake, what you're doing is you're putting that height information, so you're putting that information that I've added, so all the textures and bumps, onto the low poly model texture. So when it's in in game or in engine, um, it looks like the high poly, but doesn't have the poly count. So for instance, like this one brick has 267,000 active points, which wow. is like a lot. That's a lot for a brick. Like for yeah. for a game, that, that, that's like a full character. So uh, so when I bake that down, the brick then goes into the engine. Or the instance, since I'm using it, and uh, I wasn't, I didn't do my final renders in Maya. I done it in Marmoset. set. Uh, but then uh, these these textures, then when you look at them a bit uh, more up close, they resemble the high poly brick, but they're still retaining the shape and poly information of the low poly. So what you have here is an extremely low poly brick that just looks like a square, but then you put yeah. that texture information on top of it. It looks like the high poly brick with all the height information, the cracks, the details, the bumps. Um, so bacon, I always, I don't know if this is true, but I think bacon actually refers to when you bake something in an oven, you solidify it and you mm -hmm. add uh, like a crust. So for me, the bacon process is, is is solidifying that information on the low poly. So that's that's essentially what you're doing. And then when you bake, you create a set of what's called maps, and then these maps. Are then used to uh, apply texture information like your colors, your cracks, or the, or the extra stuff at the end. Everything starts as a low poly. So, so these barrels essentially, like for instance, um, if, I, if I solo this, um, this barrel starts as just me building out with shapes, with primitives. So, you know, you would start with a, a shape like this, mm -hmm. and then you would add um, edges to make it more complex. So, right now it's just a, a cylinder, but then if I add uh, edges around it, which gives it more information. Um, you can then start to manipulate these edges into any kind of shapes you want um, using these are the scale tools so you can you know move these in and out like this um, mm -hmm. you can also uh, rotate stuff if you wanted to or just simply move it um, left and right um, until you have you know these basic shapes that you, you would have I mean the, the best way I set it up is that um, typically if you're going to have uh, objects with more than one material you would make them into separate meshes um which means that like you know this is uh, this mm -hmm. is one mesh for the wood this is one mesh for the metal um and then you export this uh low poly to zbrush um and then you would get that initial one in and then once you've worked it up using uh tools and brushes uh it would look something like this uh so this is the high poly this is nearly 10 million uh oh edges so it's very very high poly uh but then i think the main focus of this project was also, you know, trying to get to a point where I was given everything that I made a, a little bit of love so that, you know, because I've done the barrels and the doors um, three or four times before I was really happy with them. Um, and in fact, one of the first makes mistakes I made, now that I'm saying it, um, was making this mesh one complete mesh. So when I tried to separate out the, the metal and the wood look, it was hard because it was sculpting over other things. So... Mm -hmm. Um, so now by separating them into what we call subtools, which is just different parts, um, it made it a lot easier. This is merged, so this is all together. But if you split it again, these would, these three rings would split into different parts, and the wood would. So when I was working on it, it was less intrusive, uh, and I could focus on uh, separate aspects. Same with the door. Uh, when I worked on the, the high poly door, um, I, every one of these bricks was a separate tool. So you know when I was sculpting, I could individually select them, uh, solo them as we call it in ZBrush go in and then sculpt back over um and then again these are just you know these would come in as, as very low poly objects just squares um but then if you what we call dynamesh the object uh using dynamesh basically uh, creates this geometry that you can see here that's uh extremely dense uh then it, it creates this poly group that you can then uh sculpt over or change its shape with brushes um, a lot of the brushes I used in this were the, the ones you find in Lightbox, um, which are the Trim Dynamics tools. Um, so the Trim Dynamic was uh, the main one that I used to try and take the edges off and make them a bit flatter. Mm -hmm. And then the Smooth Border was what I used to get a more refined look for stone. Um, there's a million brushes I used in this in, in these different packs and in, in different areas of the doors. Um, the trims was one of them, and they're like a ZBrush standard. But the one that I used that wasn't standard um, was the Orb 
pack brush, which is actually a super famous uh, brush pack in here, which uh, is a stylized brush pack that incorporates a lot of cracks and crevices, stone looks, um, cuts. Uh, so you can literally just, with some of these, you can just drag them and you'll see oh, you're getting cool. this effect like a cut. <laughs> Um, so you could you could literally you know even you put the intensity up you could make that deeper um, you can add it on your stone your door you know however you want to do it um, and that actually is the brainchild of an artist at Blizzard believe it or not um, and I've just I'm going to find these pages I've got it up here just now it's uh, yeah it's Michael Vicente um, I think he's French originally but he works out of Irvine yeah he mm-hmm. he's worked on multiple projects with Blizzard I think Heroes of the Storm initially and he's worked on the Warcraft Reforged um and you can kind of see some of his, his brush packs in, in action here but yeah so michael he's 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 made these brush packs for people who want to emulate that style um but don't want to maybe build things completely by hand so with a lot of these brush packs um the great thing you can do with them um which almost seems like cheating um but when you drag out a lot of these things or you get these uh these shapes that he's created it makes it just a lot easier to make these kind of details without having to refine brushes really like a lot um, especially the kind of cuts and blusters and slashes, this stuff is literally just a, a drag brush, so you can make a lot of these, you know, it takes a while to finesse these and make them look better after the fact, um, but yeah, there's a... Just like Photoshop's grass brush. <laughs> yeah, well, if you essentially... use it, If you use it out of the box, everyone's going to know you <laughs> use that grass brush. The trick is to make it look like you didn't. <laughs> yeah, well, it's the same with, uh, with even the rock, because you'll find with these bricks, um, he also has a, a, a brush called rock, uh, rock Detail, so... Although this maybe looks like impressive, and I, I probably actually, I, I probably, I could do this with uh, with height information. So there's a way you can do this with the the standard brush where you raise a lot of bumps and then you flatten the trim dynamic to get the same mm-hmm. effect. But then Michael made this brush, which literally you can just pull out, and uh, you got a brush. Oh you my! Got a Look at that. Yeah. So it's uh, it's an even more cheaty way of doing it, and as you increase the intensity, you can obviously start to mess with the actual geo. Oh wow. Um, so you, so if you want to make it, you know, because if you make it really low, you'll get these effects where it's uh, it's like a kind of just surface noise, mm-hmm. which adds to the look, but doesn't actually change the geometry. Um, but if you increase the intensity, then you can start to drag it out and it starts to actually alter what you're seeing so, at the side. So for like your dungeon scene, then you you then, ha- of course, had to handcraft just like this. Each, it, mm. n- not, a, not every individual brick, right? You'd like instance the bricks or you could duplicate them. I've done just three variations, basically. Three variations. Um, and then, and then you can randomize it and stuff? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, when you get into Marmo, um, and as long as you label the bricks as the right meshes initially, then uh, you can just basically scatter them, and they'll look, you know, broken up, or they'll look different on each kind of... You know, I made one a little mm-hmm. bit darker, one a bit lighter, um, so you get the effect at the end where it looks like it's uh, less... or less uh, No, more organic, sorry, less mm-hmm. manufactured. Yeah, I, and I think that's always the the problems that I, I ran into as a novice 3D person, and, and why I always would go right back to painting because it's like if I made something in 3D, it was always like, oh, it's just too obvious that I made it uh, in right. 3D, and I think that that might be probably where a lot of beginner 2D or 3D artists run into is that if they're using a lot of prefabricated things, or maybe they're going to kit bash too many times, it'll start, you know, everything kind of starts to look the same, and. I think that's where we originally sparked the conversation of having you on is when you go to this extra level, right? You put in the extra yeah. level of care into little yeah. each and every little component mm-hmm. of, of your scenes and of your assets. It it yeah. essentially adds to the value. It adds to the quality of mm-hmm. your entire production here. Yes, definitely. I mean, like, I think for me, initially one of the worst things I was doing as an artist was like, you know, working through a project and then being like, that's good enough like oh that'll do you know it's passable it looks like it's supposed to be. but then as you get involved in a project and especially it became almost, almost like a child where i was like oh like i really want this to look its best i really want this to look like real bricks then you get obsessive you get you know you get to a point where you're just like you're minuting over every detail which is like a curse and a blessing because you don't want to overwork things but at the same time you don't want to make them look generic so generic. there's a fine line yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I tell that to all my students all the time, particularly ones that will sign up for a particular thing. So I, you go to figure if someone's taking mm-hmm. a specific course or signing up for a you know, particular set of things, then they have mm-hmm. to have at least a baseline interest in that. And then it mm-hmm. always baffles me when they put either like minimal effort in or they're mm-hmm. um, you know, kind of tapping out 
just too soon. And mm-hmm. I always had to say, like, look, if you don't get obsessed with this, mm. yeah. somebody else is. And yeah, that's who the competition is. It's everybody else that's way mm-hmm. more obsessed about it with than you know than you are. And that's yeah. you know where you got to really kind of know you know your own um, your own strengths are, wh- where that yeah. breaking point is, what yeah. you know where your interest lies. Because if you don't put that passion in, because I think you Ooh. can only really get obsessed about all the little things if you are really passionate about something and that's what separates the people that that can tend to make it or break it in yeah. regards to progressing yeah i mean like it definitely comes under that thing where i used to look at job applications and think to myself what is this whole like attention to detail thing like what is the obsession with you know attention to detail attention but as those little things it's like when you walk about in a game for instance you know like i've just uh i've just totally enthralled myself in genshin impact i don't know why it's just took over my life but every little thing every little blade of grass every little archway every house every little you know like chair and outside in a cafe when they're so well done it's those things that grab your attention and make you feel more immersed in the world and I know that, like, initially when I looked at this project, and uh, you can probably see if, if I bring up some of the, the end files, um, but then there was parts where uh, I was doing this tutorial and I was finishing it, and then I was still going back and being like, oh, there's something wrong, there's something missing, there's there's something that I'm not quite seeing that's not making it feel complete enough. Um, and then, of course, once you go back and look at, like, first renders, then you're kind of like, oh, I understand, I get where I was coming from. I mean, this is, like... This is the first pass I think I had when I initially finished the project or finished the project. But mm-hmm. there was lots of things that weren't reading right. Like the, some of the materials were just no 100%. Um, like the bricks didn't have any height information properly because initially, even at that point, I was still like, I think these bricks look good enough again. But then I was still like, no, I mean, they're, they're not quite where they need to be. Um, I don't know if you can kind of see it. Like, yeah, I can, I can see the difference. Yeah, the difference in like just the information that they convey on how they look like bricks. The floor um, looks a lot better too. Yeah, just a lot of things lighten the grates as well. You can kind of see how the grates now have this darker, more uh, medieval look, and are, are a bit more, even dirtier at points. They have some uh, rust information on them. So initially, like looking at them, they were just they were too shiny, right? They were just too uh, the yeah, contrast too between the light and the dark was too much. Um, and the lamp was too dark as well. Um, again, that was something that I adjusted so that it was more uh, grayish, like a gray actual iron material, and I added some, some information on that as well. The door, again, just needs some polishing, some of the... Yeah, so there was just, like, tiny things I was fixing at the end. Um, the wood information, these panels, these metal panels as well, I went back and read on them. Um, but then, yeah, it was just the, 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 the last 10% in a project is always where it comes alive. It's always where you see the biggest change. And I think, like, because I finessed the hell out of that for a whole day, um, you can see, you know, if you were submitting something, if you, you know, if I'd done a kind of side by side, if uh, if you were submitting something and you went from something like, uh, you know, something like this to something, you know, on the right where I was initially, and a day later is on the left, you can just dramatically see the difference, even with the lighting loads of things that are popping out that initially even the fact that the lamps have a glow in them you know that they're, I, I even found you know because i'm new to marmoset as well which is where you would do your real-time renders so marmoset is is mimicking a real-time engine like unreal engine or unity and marmoset has a button when you click it it enables global illumination which puts all your lights on in the scene and as soon as i clicked that i was like oh my god it looks even better now and you know i put lav underneath it um, but it's like when you're playing with any kind of toy creatively, when you start to find all the buttons, you're like, oh, and what is this one doing? What is this one doing? I think the worst thing I've done was I sat up to about three in the morning because I found out in Marmoset you can also animate. So uh, I was like, oh my God, I can like I can make my bricks and my barrels fall. Like they're actually, you know, like, so you can see, you know, they're actually moving in real time. They're falling. Um, but then that was just like the extra sauce at the end that I thought made it look even better. So... Yeah, yeah, that extra ten percent. Uh, I've talked before about that on the channel, and uh, mm-hmm. it's it's the hardest you know stretch to push. And I think it, it's weird because it, it takes longer. You can you can spend like six hours on an entire piece, yeah. uh, and get it to where it even looks very similar. But then spend mm-hmm. another six hours, like you said, to a day, just yeah. doing the last little ten percent. And it, you know, mm-hmm. not everyone's not even going to notice it, but you know the people mm-hmm. that do notice it. I mean that's yeah. where it really counts because it, it, it again it's that attention to detail, it's that mm-hmm. obsession to the craft and getting mm-hmm. in there and 
right it's not necessarily i'm not going to say perfectionism but it's mm. just like you know just increasing that overall quality of mm -hmm. of the asset of, of the painting you know of the work and i did that recently myself i thought i was done the um this uh winter village it was a japanese yeah. one i thought i was mm -hmm. done and you know when i i went back the next morning mm -hmm. and i i must have spent another four days on and off <laughs> tweaking it and i was like <laughs> You know, and it was, everything was already there. I was just pulling stuff away and making adjustments. I didn't paint yeah. anything new. And right. it was, it's just boggling sometimes, you know, how, how like a different set of perspective, yeah. you know, can really, yeah. you, you get, you know, with your piece of that you can increase the overall fidelity of it. I mean, in essence, it's really just like you said, it's, it's, I think even that it's the, I mean, like, for instance, I'm going to bring up somebody here that, I mean, you probably know, but uh, Jasmine uh, was actually an artist, or is an artist that's just, she's actually just finishing school at this point, I think she's about to go try and work somewhere, but she's worked on several projects as well, but this was the a project that she submitted recently in a stylized fashion, and uh, again, this is the level I'm talking about when you talk about, you know, Wow. attention to detail pushing it you know and this was from a concept so i mean when you actually compare the concept and her work very very close um so arto he actually made this concept way back when uh in photoshop mm -hmm. and she wanted to recreate it in unreal and uh and yeah it's and it's a similar process to mine you know the low poly the high poly baking texture and, and then straight in the engine um and she even does a really good breakdown actually on uh, her materials that she made for the scene and how she made these and her assets that she created for the, the project so again another really good example um but then it was the same with me when i was making this stuff it was it was literally just taking everything that i was learning on the high level stuff that tobias was teaching about trim sheets and, and sculpting and then applying it uh the difference with my project would be that i was using a more modern pbr workflow so the physical based renderer uh, materials are ones that react more to the the real time engines. Mm -hmm. um, so this is like this is less Blizzard uh, World of Warcraft. It's more Blizzard Overwatch, if that makes sense. Um, so Overwatch still has a stylized, almost cartoony look, but it's using modern materials and technologies that make it look, you know, more next gen. Whereas Warcraft still retains that Disney aesthetic, the hand painted, hand crafted look. Mm -hmm. um so that was that was basically how this came about and then that also bled into my next project which was then uh following a 3dx a 3d ex tutorial um creating this low poly bridge um using everything that i'd learned from that that project and then applying it to another prop and um correct me if i'm wrong too almost like the same week too that you had published that last project and you had a new job opportunity right yeah, so I've been I've actually been picked up to work with an indie studio on a, a project that they're currently working on that hasn't been announced, so I can't really talk about it. But uh, but yeah, like that email came almost I think about four or five days after I published that project, um, which I think is just the the icing on the cake when people talk about like you know when, people, when a lot of students approach me like guys from the the podcast or even people who are super low level just starting would say. You know, how do I find work? How do I find people? How and, you know, because they've seen me connecting with people, and that's how they get my opportunities. But I'm like, the mantra really is that like, if you make it, they will come. Like, if you make a good enough portfolio, mm -hmm. people will find you. They will definitely like flog to you for work, as opposed to you chasing after them. Um, I've seen it time and time again when when students try to chase work and they're not quite ready. Um, but then when they make that one killer piece right, and then of course straight after it they get an email like, "Oh, would you be up for a job offer? Would you be up for this?" And it's because the portfolio is like it's, it's unmissable, right? It's something that you just can't take your eyes off. You notice it in trending, you notice it on a page or eight levels reshared or something like that. You know that's where the opportunities really come from. You'll notice even back in 2019 there was several environment artists that you know either won art station challenges or were published by eight level or had their work featured somewhere those are all the people now who are working at like ubisoft and you mm -hmm. know other different companies because those people are picked up because although people will say you know it's super hard to work in the industry and you know there aren't enough jobs there's actually there's a ton of jobs there's and a lot it, of jobs I, there's a lot of people that the, the recruiters really struggle sometimes to find people but like if you make yourself very visible by doing these projects or putting yourself out there then they will come to you very quickly with offers so um so yeah and that's on that note too that's that's what i found is the best way to learn either a new skill set or to train yourself or to practice you know increasing either your quantity and your quality preferably both uh, both is to do a small and manageable project regardless yeah. if you're 2d if you're 3d mm -hmm. 
small projects because that, what that's going to help anybody do is focus which is yeah. something that's like draining from people left and right more and yep. more these days there's tutorials everywhere there's distractions everywhere there's social medias but you need to get that focus back by working on a small project yes. and that's that's where it's at I think it's making something like a diorama that's very manageable because I think even I've seen, I am I definitely fell into the trap very early on. In fact, I'll try and get it up here so I can show you. Um, although I say trap, it was also quite a small uh, a small project that I, I took on really early because um, I think I still have my, yeah, I've, I've kind of, I've took this off visibility so you can't really see it. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it is still here. Um, if I can, can I view this on community? I think I can. Um, and I'm sure it was it. Yeah, so this is, this was like, that's just god i hate looking at this now four this years ago one, yeah this is this is when i was still at university um learning 3d and this was an end of year project and like everybody on the planet who learns 3d um i made a sci-fi corridor yeah um but i'd also just learned substance then as well so i think what saved this project was the texturing although it doesn't quite look at in the lighter scenes because this stuff is is very harsh on the eye but then uh the overall project was uh it was it was an animation more than an actual uh mm -hmm. scene so what I done was uh, at the time I think also like Doom was just about to come out the first you know the remake the relaunch, yeah. so I was making these and also I played Dead Space back in the day so this was like a, a kind of homage to that. Wow. But I made but I made that kind of first person uh, 3D animated corridor and textured and lit it all and and you know this is also while I was actually interning at Axis Studios in Glasgow and they were working on like Destiny 2 and League of Legends and stuff like that so. I was getting a lot of inspiration for the stuff they were doing, and uh, and then yeah, the, this was like my final project, uh, which at the time got an A. You know, people really mm -hmm. loved it. Um, but then, of course, measuring against industry standards, um, it still is lacking in, in certain areas. But I think for one of my first attempts at a three D project, it was definitely, it was definitely, it came out better than I thought it was going to be. Definitely, I felt like it was, it was an accomplishment at the time. Um, and now, fast forward, and of course, you know, I'm I'm doing less realistic stuff. But the dungeon, I think, is definitely an accumulation of a lot of skills that I learned over the last couple of years. Just looking at other people's pieces of work and, and you know, laboring over art station every day, looking at trend and stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, and then, yeah, this is this is the result. And uh, it's definitely, you know, it's took me a while to get here. I mean, I think the whole project took me about three weeks. Um, but then I think it was it was worth it, the time and effort that I put in it. It was, you know, it shows at the end. Yeah, I think that's the... the... Personally, I think that's the perfect duration for like a, a small project that you can make manageable and you'll see results good enough that you you know you could still feel that you can measure it against you know whether it's a success or not is somewhere between three to three to four weeks for a good project will really let you kind of fill out you know your, your skill sets and, and test you know test what you have and, and put it to something that you know, is really, you can gauge where things are going to head and, and where things have been and stuff like that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah definitely. I mean, I'd like, I like, I would definitely say that in my next project, I want to try and go, you know, more refined and, and probably even focus more on a couple of really good pie level props. Because I think, especially for environment artists, I've been told that the kind of key or the, the kind of base level for a lot of portfolios is to have one really well done environment and maybe one or two, two or three really well done props. Um, so I mean, like the the bridge is one of them definitely, but I've got aspirations to do a couple of other ones in my mind at the, the back of my mind. That I'm going to do I, even, you know, after I spent that two or three weeks in ZBrush making something like this orc was also it came a lot easier to me. It was just more uh, streamlined than I used to be when I got into ZBrush because especially ZBrush that was one of the more scary programs, especially for more realistic mm -hmm. stuff. People do it less. It's more just for deformation or boolean, but. With stylized people, like a lot of your stuff lives and breathes in ZBrush because you have to add that that detail, that extra information. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there was a lot of stuff I do I done in ZBrush after the fact that that uh, I just felt more comfortable approaching um, after I'd been in ZBrush for a couple of weeks. So so yeah, I definitely think it's one of these things where you will feel like you're dragging on a project, or you feel like you're maybe losing steam towards the end. But then, once you come out at the end of that and you've produced something, you'll find your entire workflow and pipeline is more efficient. And that's the old thing where you talk about students want to be quick at stuff: is that speed really does come with just the iteration process. The more you yeah. do things, you will get quicker. Yeah, and I think it, it's again a refocusing on of the what might be perceived priorities. People think mm. you have to be fast to get a job, or no, you just got to work on quality, you know, first and yeah. foremost. I think quality is always at the top of the top of the ladder there that you, you want to aim for. 
I mean, speed, definitely. speed's yeah. always with experience. Yeah, I think we talked about this in the podcast as well, where we even talked about where, you know, someone like would ask, you know, an, an artist high level at an event, like, you know, how long did this take you? And the, the question is almost redundant to a point because, you know, it, what took him 10 hours would maybe take you three weeks. So, I mean, it, it's probably as good to initially gauge how long something should take. But then when somebody's that high level, it's, it is almost just not even going to be relevant to you because, yeah. you know, yeah, it, it's something that's it's, it's going to be information that you're not going to be able to take back into your studio and work with so um yeah well really cool brush flows what what overall software would you recommend people to, where would they want to start if they're trying to get into like either asset design prop design or just being like a 3d generalist where is the place to start and that that answer kind of changes all the time but uh because for <laughs> even for like but for, for 2d people like photoshop has been the standard for a long time like you know yeah. if you want to, like i mean obviously there's painter tool sci there's other things there's affinity now um but for 3d um i was trained in maya autodesk maya which typically is an animation program um because it was built to you know harbor a lot of these animation tools that industry now use like guys at like pixar that now use more of their proprietary software but they initially all use autodesk maya um, Max is also a great one to get into, um, but now of course Blender is free, um, and will actually now use a lot of the same tool sets that Maya does use as well. Um, I think that's also why Maya changed the pricing because a student license, if you're at school, a student license for Maya is free as long as you can prove that you're at school. Um, but then their standard license, if you want to do work, um, it used to be something almost like three hundred dollars a month. Um, <sighs> That's yeah, which is a, which is a lot, but now they've changed it to three hundred dollars a year, which is still, I mean, money. But then, like compared to what it used to be, it's it's you know a fraction of what it cost. Um, but Blender is free, so yeah. And there's there's actually there's a lot of game studios now who are using Blender in their pipeline because it's also saving them on license fees. So so Blender is a good place to start just to try. If you want to get on a more professional level, or maybe use a, a program that is more widely used, then yeah, Maya, Max are the two kind of standard industry tools for making 3d assets um and then zbrush of course um which is practically inexpensive at this point i think you can buy the the monthly license now they do a monthly perpetual license so i think it's like 20 bucks a month or something mm -hmm. um or if you buy i think the thousand dollar version um it's a li like a lifetime thing so forever and ever and ever zbrush is around for that thousand you'll always have zbrush um and then texturing it depends on where you want to go for most stylized stuff i know people at blizzard will use stuff like 3d coat typically because they want to hand paint textures uh if you want a more pbr workflow or more modern workflow for more stylized games uh substance is, is very standard now in the industry um although it's also just been bought by adobe recently so you know big changes coming in there mm -hmm. if you want to build materials or substance designer um so there's a vast array of stuff but yeah like maya max and blender are your kind of base starting points um is and it... just a, yeah what would be uh, for someone okay they got these softwares maybe one or two of them what is your what is your go-to resource for like tutorials or just learning some of the basics of this are you sticking with like youtube is there any artist names you want to shout out there that have really good either tools to download or buy or or walkthroughs to follow oh god i could be here all day <laughs> all right all right give, give, give me one give me one yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i've got that I've can got of worms one, yeah. We've got a bunch here, but uh, well, obviously, everybody uh, email Gordon if you have questions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll leave my email. But well, as Tyler knows, CGMA have really, really good courses, um, not yep. only in 3D but also 3D. Um, so CGMA are one asset that I definitely would say. Um, 3D EX is is a, a guy I know, but not personally, but he is on YouTube and uh, typically does stylized assets and does uh, one or two tutorials every couple of weeks. Um, really, really, that's all free on YouTube. He also has a patron that you can sign up for five bucks a month. And he has like courses on how to 3D model. Um, awesome. There's there's Flip Normals, which is one of the biggest sources for 3D stuff just now, especially ZBrush training, um, ArtStation Learning. There's uh, YouTube. I mean, especially people don't really actually give YouTube its credit. The fact that there's so much information on there just now for free. Yeah, it's been getting uh, me through Blender basics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's good old YouTube. I, I got to bring up, like, I'll be following one tutorial. They'll kind of yeah. gloss over something. I got to look up a tutorial to get through this section of tutorial. And in yeah. a worst case scenario, I got to look up a third tutorial to get through that guy's section. But it's all yeah. manageable. It is all there. Because, yeah. again, Blender is free and, and YouTube's free. So it's well documented. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, there's also stuff like Brushforge, which is like, I think this is actually... 
Uh, there's a couple of courses in here that are run by Blizzard artists, so mm -hmm. these guys have a real extensive library of uh, tutorials for, for 3D artists. Um, but the one thing I do want to shout out and, and give uh, a really big uh, section to is the Discord communities. So for people who want to get involved in 3D, there's three that I would recommend that are, are they have a similar mission, but they all hold different approaches. Um, there's Beyond Extent, which is run by Timothy Dries. Uh, so Timothy is currently an environment artist in Ubisoft Berlin. He's working on Far Cry 6. So uh, he has this small community where they get together and they talk uh, different aspects of environment art. So they share tooltips, they share tutorials, they give feedback on works in progress. So they're a really good community to get involved in. Um, it does, the community and the Discord aspect has to come through uh, a patron, which I think is five bucks a month. But it's really mm -hmm. for, for what you get, it's nothing. Um, there's also the Dynasty Empire. Or Dynasty. Dynasty uh, is run by an, also an environment artist from Ubisoft, but he works mm -hmm. on the Division game. He works in Massive and Malmo. Uh, Jeremy, yeah, so he runs um, he runs this, this, this similar thing. They have works in progress. They're a bigger community, though, so they have like hundreds and hundreds of members, nearly thousands. So that's definitely a, more noise, uh, but still a really good community to get involved in. And the last one uh, is Experience Points, which is run um, by someone I know on YouTube called Kem. And Kem uh, made this a game with similar aspirations to Beyond Extent and Dynasty. It's an environment art Discord and community where you can uh, get featured and, and get feedback on your work. Um, so yeah, the, there's multiple. Awesome. But Th thank yeah. you so much for sharing. I had no idea about yeah. any of these. I yeah, don't yeah. there any of them are for me, but yeah, for anyone <laughs> out there that love this 3D side of, yeah, yeah. of things, like yeah, that's how to do it. And I think pay, paying five dollars to to either subscribe to some of these, you know, to uh -huh. support these people on Patreon, that is like such a you know manageable amount. Of, yeah. of money to get like one step further and because it'll mm -hmm. kind of show your commitment as well i think just because yeah. like i people don't know where to start some people don't want to pay money but you know it it really is a great alternative to like not taking a like an 800 hundred dollar course or to like you know move across country go to like one of those atelier schools when you you know you just put five dollars in your bucket here 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 now you're invested in all these communities you got a good circulation of feedback going on and information yeah. i think that's what it is it's the flow of information mm -hmm. um you know, getting the right information getting to you yeah. is um it, it there's just it's invaluable really yeah so anything you want to plug for your stuff before we uh, depart for today before we end, yeah. Uh, I mean, like, probably the biggest thing is, is just to talk about, for five minutes, just to talk about my podcast. Um, Tyler was on it uh, just recently. His episode will be going live, hopefully soon. When you're hearing this, I know this will go live. But, yeah, your, your one should be next. We just we just had a feature with uh, uh, Kirill uh, from 80 Level. So we talked about the 80 Level guys. Uh, we've interviewed Jose Vega from the Castlevania series. Um, we've got Finnis McManus on, Hannah Watts, uh, uh, Danya as well, who worked on Last of Us, Jan Urschel, Shad Shafari. We've done a Black Lives Matter podcast. I mean, there's there's a there's a plethora of stuff to listen to. And so you do. have, you know, you got a lot. I see a lot of big names there. Like that. This is a yeah, lot of, yeah. This is a very good resource for for everybody that just wants something else to listen to while they're yeah, grinding yeah. away. Yeah, I mean, we had guys from Double Fine on, from the the Psychonauts guys, and guys mm -hmm. from Borderlands and. Loads of other game studios. I mean, Tobias is on here that I just talked about. Uh, we invented mm -hmm. Glauco Longi after he finished God of War. Uh, so, like, there's, there's a ton of people. We're actually, I think we're one of the few people in the planet also uh, to have interviewed Scott Robertson. So we have, we interviewed Scott Robertson. Um, I think that was, God, that was about three or four years ago. But, yeah, Scott came on and talked about um, his book, How to Draw and How to Render, and his career as well, which was a great honour. So, yeah, there's, there's a... There's a plethora of resources on that that channel that you can use uh, to to further your art career in any aspect. Because we've interviewed two D artists, three D artists, people in film, games, the load. So yeah. All right, guys, I'm gonna have a link below to check out the digital art cast right there. You guys definitely give it a view. It, it looks very awesome. Yes. And I, I the it's last one I listened to, I'm a little behind. I did listen. Mm. The last one I think I listened to was Jan, uh, Han uh, Han Urschel's, right? That's Jan. His, yeah. Like, Jan, Jan. Yeah. Yeah. He's. He's in, really uh, he, he's in Singapore, I think, just now. But, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, he's he, he's worked on Star Wars, Ghost in the Shell, loads of stuff. Like, you know, loads of Marvel franchises, Captain Marvel, all that kind of stuff. Like, yeah, Jan's a, he's a freelance concept artist, but he does uh, he's worked on a ton of stuff. So, yeah. 
And his tutorials have been getting me through uh, Blender too. <laughs> oh yeah, he has a really, name. really good Blender resource as well. Yeah, Jan's yeah. one of the few people, two D people, who's using Blender really well. I think the other one would be uh, Yama, Yama Yurbrev. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's there's a third people uh, try master uh, Blender for concept. But I'm in Jan... all their Patreons trying to like get my <laughs> get my assets and my tool sets up, up to deal support. Get your chops up. That's, I'm not gonna mention my own at all but like support the people that can help you out yeah yeah definitely and, man there's, there's there's so many artists in this industry we could sit here all day and just rhyme off names but yeah there's so much stuff out there but yeah support local artists man because uh so there, there's there's loads of stuff out there you can find but yeah awesome well thank you for coming on today uh gordon um it's been an absolute pleasure again talking to you and awesome. you, you know taking your time to share all this information with you know not only myself but of course everybody else so yeah yeah i uh, thank you again we'll have to get you back on you know down yeah. the line at some point as well thank you for having me on it's a real pleasure to, to be on yes. here and talk and yeah it's been great guys thanks for watching please hit the subscribe if you want to see more you can check me out on facebook art station and instagram if you want more in-depth content from me, I teach two courses at the CG Master Academy, Architecture Design and Fundamentals of Design. If you want even more learning, you can go to BrushSauceAcademy.com and sign up for one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Join me hundreds of students around the world and start improving your art and design today. If you want to be part of a community, we have Brush Sauce on Discord. We have monthly challenges and hangouts. There are links below for everything I mentioned. Thanks again for watching and take care.